Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's stand, please. Everyone, let's stand just for a moment. What a wonderful time of praise and worship we have enjoyed in the building this morning. And uh, yeah, go ahead and clap your hands for the praise team. Absolutely incredible today. God is good. And um, do not forget tonight, uh, a night of worship. It's going to be super powerful. I'm confident that the glory of God is just going to set down in this place tonight. People are going to be healed and delivered and restored, refreshed, revived, renewed. God's going to do his thing in this house tonight. Uh, let's pray for Perry right now. Would you join hands with the person next to you? Father, we stand in agreement. Your word says, if we agree as touching anything, it shall be done. So we touch and we agree and we speak healing right now to Perry Wilson as Pastor Ronnie goes to the hospital even now. We pray that you give him a conspicuous anointing to lay hands on Perry and he be healed. And Father, we give you praise for the miracle and the testimony you're building in this man. In Jesus' name. Clap your hands and give him praise one more time. Amen. Come on, you ought to praise him like you just got healed. Amen. Glory to God. And Carrie, I want to say, Elder Carrie Austin, congratulations to you on winning your award. You are a great speaker. Clap your hands for Elder Carrie. Awesome. Because we have church tonight, it's at 6, right? At 6 o'clock. I'm just going to preach till 5 so we can just run and get a burger and come back. Now, I'm not going to preach long so you can get home and, and then get back here at 6 o'clock. I just want to say something about Oklahoma City. Um, you know, you guys know I live down there now, and it's unique. <laughs> Y'all pray for me to find a place out here quick. Um, Y'all know I'm from Baton Rouge, so Mardi Gras, is a, you know, it's a big thing in Louisiana. Well, I just want you to know New Orleans ain't got nothing on Oklahoma City. Because whatever festival is going on downtown right now, they partied all night long. I got up at 4.30, and it sounded like a band was on my balcony. And people were screaming, and I thought, well, it's got to end soon, God. It has to end soon. So I just stepped out on my balcony, and uh, I looked down, and the cars were rolling in. And I thought they were leaving, but they were parking and getting out of the car. And I thought, wow, Oklahoma City, the city that does not sleep. <laughs> and it's a festival of something. I don't know what arts, yeah, all that. Painting, food, music. I think they just want to have a festival over anything. They had the dogs barking, the train rolling. It was wild. So we're praying that the festival comes to a close soon. Do not go to that festival and miss the festival that's going to happen here tonight. Be here at 6 o'clock. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Now begin our message this morning with verse number 6 and read through verse number 13. What a sweet anointing in this place today and the anointing and the presence of God represents his endorsement if his presence is there that is him endorsing our gathering and certainly he is among us today Matthew chapter 26 verse number 6 if you have it say amen, amen. now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box a very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. 
For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, whosoever or where, wheresoever this gospel is preached in the world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. I'm just going to preach this message this morning entitled, When We Worship. I want you to say those words to a few people around you. Just say, When We Worship. Now let us pray one more time. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word, the intensity of the praise, the intimacy of the worship, and the hunger for a word from you. And we ask you to speak clearly today. Let us hear what you are saying to the church in this critical hour. And we give you praise for what shall transpire in the next few moments of time. Every generational curse is broken. Every generational spirit is dismissed from our destiny, and we give you praise. Clap your hands one more time and praise them real good in the building. That's pretty good, but I really want you to go ahead and praise him and lift your voice and thank him today. Now high five three people and tell them this is my worship before you sit down. This is my worship before you sit down. Matthew chapter 26. The story that precedes the story that I just read to you is the story of the Good Samaritan. And the story of the Good Samaritan is a story of love for your neighbor. So it's stocked full of the idea of works. And we know that the Bible tells us that faith without works is dead. But this story is not about love for your neighbor. This story is about love for God. The theme of the story is summed up in one word, and that word is worship. To worship is to quicken the conscience to the holiness of God. To worship is to feed the mind with the truth of God. To worship is to purge the imagination by the beauty of God. To worship is to open the heart to the love of God. To worship is to devote the will to the purpose of God. Someone once said that an ounce of worship is an unsuitable acknowledgement for an ocean of mercy. I'll say it again. An ounce of worship is an unsuitable acknowledgement for an ocean of mercy. I wrote this this morning that worship is the most momentous, the most urgent, the most glorious action that can take place in a human's life. And W. Tozer said it like this, God wants worshipers before workers. Indeed, the only acceptable workers are those who have learned the lost art of worship. The very stones would praise him if the need arose and a thousand legions of angels would leap to do his will. Someone else said, for worship is a thirsty land crying out for rain. Worship is a candle in the act of being kindled. Worship is a drop in quest of the ocean. Worship is a voice in the night calling out for help. Worship is a soul standing in awe before the mystery of the universe. Worship is time flowing into eternity. Worship is a man climbing the stairs of the altar to experience an encounter with God. Worship. There are many keys that are given to us that we call keys of the kingdom. The Bible tells us we have rights and we have responsibilities as believers. You have authority through certain modes of living to bring heaven to earth. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 19, that I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth, shall be bound where? In heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth 
shall be loosed in heaven. Every key we need to bring heaven to earth is in our possession. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. It is not what is happening in heaven shall happen in earth. It is whatever we make happen in earth happens in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. That tells me that heaven hov hovers over earth in a mode of expectation and anticipation, wanting to do something in the earth that's already established in heaven. But heaven cannot come to earth until the people of God use the keys that God has given us to use. So I started thinking about it. And I started thinking about some of these keys. And I asked God, I was like, Lord, speak to me and tell me what works down here that makes things happen in heaven, that brings heaven to earth. And I thought about the most practical of institutions that we enjoy as believers. And one is called the art of prayer. Somebody shouted, prayer works. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 5, When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you in public. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Did you hear it? He has them before you ask. But if you don't ask, he can't release them. In this manner, you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. It's already done, but it can't come down until you call it down. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the what? Kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. So a key to bringing heaven to earth is prayer. Notice what Jesus did not say. Jason, he did not say if you pray. He said when you pray denoting the idea that God expects us to pray because without prayer, he cannot get to us what we need him to get to us. So he said, there's a channel. If you'll just offer it up to me, then I'll bring down everything you need because I know what you need before you start praying, but I'm not gonna get it to you until you pray. So we can't take prayer out of our life. We can't take prayer out of our devotion to God. Prayer is essential. Prayer is a key. So I start thinking about it. And I say, Lord, I want to thank you right now for the key called prayer. And what did it make me want to do? Pray more. Are y'all with me today? So I start thinking more. Lord, what activates heaven and the earth? Felt impressed to write this down, that prophecy works. Not only does prayer work, but prophecy works. To prophesy is to speak or to sing under inspiration in order to make a prediction. So prophecy does not just, is not something that is just spoken. It is something that is sung, but it can't be sung until there is an inspiration. So you must be inspirited. What spirit are you of? Because if you have the wrong spirit, you can predict things that are very evil and very harmful. 
That's why you must be careful about who speaks in here because ultimately it's going to come out of here. You can't let everybody put their stuff inside of you because if you let everybody fill you up with their words, you're going to start repeating what they've said instead of saying one that God has given you the power to see in your own world. Prophecy is you speaking words about your future. So everything that God has preordained for you to enjoy in your future is released when you begin to prophesy to your tomorrows. There's about 15 people hearing it. That's good with me. Somebody shout prophecy works. So if prophecy works and it calls things out of heaven to the earth, then why don't we use the, that key and un unlock the doors of our children's destiny by every day when they wake up, we walk up in their bedroom and we say in the name of Jesus, you are secure, you are blessed, you are saved, you are successful. I prophesy it, I predict it before your peers can speak any words up in your life. I'm gonna go ahead and speak the word of God up over your life because God is for you. He is not against you you, you have potential, you have purpose, you have promise and you're going to be successful I prophesy it in the name of Jesus and then all of heaven's authority jumps down on those words, puts them on your kids, your kids go to school and they feel safe all day long, before long they are walking in confidence and not arrogance, why? Because you have prophesied over their life somebody shall prophesy look at your neighbor and tell them pray Look at your other neighbor and tell them prophesy. So I begin to see these keys and I'm thinking, okay, prayer works. That's scriptural. It's in the Bible. Prophecy works. It's in the Bible. Ezekiel said, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone. If Ezekiel, if Ezekiel does not prophesy, then everything that is segregated cannot be integrated. Everything that is torn apart cannot come back together. If God could just get a people that would look at scattered stuff in their life and say in the name of Jesus, it's all coming back together. The structure's coming back together. The sinews are coming back together. There's breath coming into this. Somebody shall prophesy. So prayer works. Prophecy works. I started thinking what else works. And then I felt this praise works. Praise always works. Acts chapter 16 verse 25 and at midnight Paul and Silas number one prayed. Then after they prayed they started singing praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And certainly, suddenly there was a great earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. What time did they pray? At midnight. Midnight is the darkest hour, but midnight is the beginning of a new day. The day doesn't start when the sun comes up. The day starts at 12.01 in your darkest hour. And if you will enter your darkest hour, over the threshold into a new day with a prayer in your heart and a praise in your mouth. I promise you God will begin to open up stuff for you you've never dreamed of. The power of praise is this. You say, Pastor Rick, you talk to us about praise all the time because when you praise, it not only affects your life, it affects people around you who may be in prison. My Bible tells me two guys prayed two guys praised, but everybody's doors open. What if two people in this building decided I'm going to give God the best praise I can possibly give him? As a matter of fact, I ain't even doing it for me. I'm doing it for everybody on this road because if I'll praise him with all my heart, somebody else's door might be open. If I'll praise him with all my vehemence, somebody else's prison may be unlocked. I double dog dare you to take two minutes and praise him like you want something to open up. Praise him until you feel heaven open. Praise him until you feel something breaking. 
Praise is so powerful. Praise is so powerful. Praise is so powerful. Judah's name means praise. Moses prayed over Judah and he said, Oh Lord, hear the voice of Judah. Hear the voice of praise. The voice of Judah is a voice of proclamation and it's a voice of claiming. In other words, when you are praising, you are proclaiming that God brought me out of darkness over into his marvelous light. You are testifying that if it was not for God on my side, I don't know where I would be today, but God got a hold of me. And God brought me out of sin. And God brought me out of bondage. And God brought me out of addiction. It's a proclamation that says, God has delivered me. You don't only proclaim something, but praise also means to claim something. In other words, when you begin to praise, you begin to claim everything that's yours. I told you this story, but I'm going to tell you one more time. When I was at the airport, see, Paul, and my bag came by, and I missed it. And somebody down the road grabbed my bag, and they started to leave with my bag. And I said, it's not only what was in the bag, it's the bag itself. I said, hold on, hey, hey, hey. And he stopped, and he looked at me, I said, you got my bag. He said, look just like my bag. I said, check the claim tag. He looked at it. He said, oh, it is your bag. Is your name Rick Hawkins? I said, that's my bag, brother. If I wouldn't have said, hey, that's mine, he would have walked out and it would have taken me days to get my stuff. But because I lifted my voice and said, hey, I came by to tell you, if you'll lift your voice in praise, the devil will bring back to you everything he's trying to take. But you got to claim it. You got to praise loud enough to let the devil know everything you stole, you bring it back to me. Everything I lost is coming back to me. I dare about 40 more people jump on your feet and praise him until you feel like your stuff is coming back. Come on, praise him until the enemy starts bringing your stuff back to you. Go ahead and nudge your neighbor and tell him if you're not going to praise him, I'll praise him for me and for you. But God has been too good to me. If it was not for God, I'd be locked up in prison in Louisiana today. If it was not for God, I would be addicted to some crack cocaine. If it was not for God, oh my, I got a reason. Does anybody in here have a reason to look back over your life? Find one thing he ever did for you. Throw your hands up, lean your head back, and open your mouth and shout to God with a voice of triumph. He been good to you. The old saints used to say, you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. You can't praise him like I praise him. You can't give him the praise that I'm giving him because I don't know what he's done for you, but I know what he's done for me. And if I praise him to my dying day, it would not be enough. I wish I had a church full of people. Just for about two minutes, clap your hands, open your mouth, give God a praise like you done lost your natural mind. I praise you, Jesus.
royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Tell your neighbor, I am crazy. Don't mistake it. I'm crazy about the one. Chosen generation, holy nation, royal priesthood, that you should praise him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Jesus said, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out in your place. But I'm going to get my praise. He's going to get his praise. Don't let a rock get in your place. Two more minutes. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Praise your name. Lord, fill this house with praise. Praise your name. Praise your name, Jesus. Come on, high five somebody and tell them, don't get nervous, honey. Come on, just tell them, don't get nervous. It's all good. Don't get nervous. Amen. Woo! Somebody shout, prayer works. Bridge, just turn me up just a little bit here. Say it again. Prayer works. <laughs> Prophecy works. <laughs> Say keys. keys. Prayer works. <laughs> Prophecy works. <laughs> Praise works. <laughs> Be seated just a moment. Prayer works. Because it's communication. It's communication, and it's often expressed with a request attached to it. Prayer, communication. Prayer is not all about you telling God everything you want. Sometimes prayer involves you being quiet and listening. Prayer works, prophecy works, it is inspiration that influences your future. Prophecy works. It is inspiration that influences your future. You tell your future how it's going to be. Prophecy works. Praise works because praise is a proclamation for what he has done. And it is an expect expectation of what he's about to do. When we praise him, we're not only thanking him for all he has done, we are thanking him for everything he's about to do. There was an old song we used to sing that said, don't wait till the battle is over. Y'all don't remember that? Praise him right now. Shout now. Don't wait to the other side of the war. Praise him now because if you praise him now, he will terrify your enemies and your tomorrows. Mm. Praise works. Prayer works. Prophecy works. Worship works. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercies, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or your spiritual worship. Worship is not a song, it's a life. Hmm. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. When Jesus was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and what? Worshiped him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Verse 2 says three key words. He worshiped him. 
See, worship is a little more intimidating than praise because praise is a celebration. But worship requires intimacy with God. Your worship, according to this text, positions you for his will. You say, Pastor Rick, how do you come up with that? Well, the Bible just said it to you. Can I stop and pause and help somebody in you? You're not going to ever hear me anything, preach anything that's not in the Bible. So for all of you that are, you know, listening with antennas up to something I might say wrong, give yourself a break and just enjoy the service. I'm reading the Bible to you. This is the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E, gospel. Your worship positions you for his will. He worshiped him. Three words. He worshiped him. That tells me I can worship my way into his will. His worship positioned him to make his petition. After he worshiped, then he asked, if you will, you can make me clean. See, when we worship, we're not always aware of what God is doing because our focus is on what we are doing. In essence, worship is our faith response to God. Worship is something we do believing he's doing something for us. That while we're worshiping, he's preserving. While we're worshiping, he's protecting. I've seen people go through the worst crisis in their life and lose everything, but they worship. And I've watched those same people come out the other side of the crisis with more confidence, more security in their identity than they ever had before because they refused to lose their worship during the warfare. If you're going to be anything, be a worshiper. You might not be eloquent in your speech. You may not stand with a microphone in your hand behind a pulpit. You might not talk to the multitudes of people, but that don't make you a worshiper. God is good. What's different about this woman? And I'm almost done. Almost done. What others called waste, she called worship. Why are you wasting your time going to that church? Why are you wasting your time singing them songs? To you, it's waste. But to me, it's worship. It's not what she brought into the room where he was. It's what she let out. See, it's not what you brought in here. Y'all not hearing me today. It's not what you brought in this building. It's what you let out of you once you got in here. See, we all came here today carrying different stuff. Some of our stuff was in better condition than others but we all brought something. And it's not what you brought, but it's what you let out as a result of what you brought. In other words, I came with pain. I came hurting, but that's not going to stop me from letting my worship out to the God that created me. Never let your problems dictate your worship y'all didn't hear that there never let what you going through dictate what you going to do when you start worshiping hmm. thank you Jesus let me just say this to you what she did is she broke something open and released its content Brokenness is your friend. 
Some of y'all just refuse to accept that because you are so holy, sanctified, whole, and perfect. You can't believe you might go through a broken season. Well, let me help you. I don't care how sanctified you are. That don't make your husband sanctified. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to say it again. Brokenness is your friend. Until you are broken, there are certain things that cannot be released up out of you. Is that scriptural, Bishop? Would I tell you anything that's not scriptural? No. Jesus took the bread. He blessed it. Then he broke it, which tells me God breaks blessed stuff. I'm too blessed to be broke. No, you're not. You're a prime candidate. Here's a common denominator among all of us. Everybody in here going to go through some stuff. Everybody. If you've never been broken, you will be broken. If you've been broken before, you'll probably be broken again. It's your friend. If she don't break it, then she, can, she cannot release the content or the substance. Let me just say this to you. Worship is more than sound. Worship is substance. It's not sound being expressed. It's substance being released. Woo. And I believe that God allows us many times to go through brokenness to get the best out of us. Yeah. Have you ever seen somebody going through brokenness really worship? Stand where I stand. And you see it every Sunday because people bring their brokenness to the altar. And they worship then like they've never worshiped before. Brokenness is your friend. Brokenness will help you to get on the path to wholeness. Ooh, come on, Pastor Rick. So the next time you feel yourself breaking down, just tell brokenness, come on in. Because when you hit me, I'm about to release a worship that I've never released in my whole entire life. If you think there's nothing in me, hit me and find out what comes out of me. God is good. Do you love him today? I think I close. I really don't want to. I really want to preach all day, but I'll close. Watch what Jesus said. I'm going to say that one more time. Watch what Jesus said. Because when you're really serving God, the only one that really counts is what he says. Because everybody's going to have an opinion about your worship. So if you run around here asking everybody, am I worshiping according to the way you would like me to worship? <laughs> Are you sure you're happy with the way I'm doing this? You're going to die apologizing. <laughs> Come on, Pastor Rick. What did Jesus say? He said, number one, why trouble her? In other words, don't bring turbulence in this devotion. Don't trouble her. She's busy right now. Look what else he said. Three words that are almost rude. No, they are rude. Jesus said rude things. He called religious people whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. You got this little picture of a feeble Jesus all drawed up. 
God ain't the savior I serve, baby. I serve a man's man. I serve the king of kings and lord of lords. He said these words, and I could hear him sternly say, leave her alone. I don't believe he said, now y'all don't leave her alone. Why are y'all bothering her? Please leave her alone. No, I believe Jesus looked at them disciples. Disciples. We're not talking about sinners. We're talking about people following him. And said, leave her, what? Alone. You know what God tells Satan when you come in here to start worshiping? Here's Satan's profession. In case y'all ever want to know what he does for a living, he's an accuser of the brethren. That's his job. Right? So anytime you hear other people repeating what Satan says, go ahead and identify who they are. <laughs> Satan is an accuser of the, he's always telling God what you're doing wrong. So in Zechariah chapter 2, Joshua the priest comes to worship God, and what does Satan do? Stand at the right hand of God and say, Don't you know who this is? And God looks at Satan and said, The Lord rebuke you. I'm not even going to let Joshua do it, I'm going to do it myself because I know him. He's a brand that I plucked out of the fire. And then he said, now take the dirty clothes off of him and put clean clothes on him. Some of, you, some of you think because of what you did last night and two nights ago, you're disqualified to lift your hands in this place. Let me help you. I don't care what you said or what you did. If you decide to get your hands up and start worshiping him, don't worry about what your neighbor sitting next to you knows about what you did last night. Oh, y'all ain't liking it because there's a religious devil up in this building today. If we all had to be perfect before we worship, you're going to die wanting to be a worshiper. Woo! Go ahead, Pastor Rick. Preach the gospel, man. Watch the disciples. They're going to look at Jesus and say, if he was a man of God, he would know that woman is a sinner. You are right, disciples. I know she's a sinner. And I'm going to let her keep on worshiping. Even though you might not approve of it, I didn't ask you your opinion. Y'all not hearing me preach to you today. God ain't asking everybody that knows you their opinion about you worshiping him. So you got to get a made up mind like this lady that you don't care what others think. It's your worship. If it was their worship, you would have to ask them permission to use it. Well, God is good. Look at your neighbor and tell him, leave me alone. No, no, you didn't say it mean though. I need you to get your forehead all messed up. Let's do it like this. Everybody say, Satan, leave me alone. That's good stuff, man. You can't let the devil dictate your worship. I'll stop. I'll stop. I can tell y'all looking a little bored. It's all right, don't. Her worship perceived opportunity. Watch what Jesus said. Here he goes being rude again. <laughs> this could have been sold and money gave to the poor. What did Jesus say? The poor you gonna always have with you. Oh, y'all already mad at Jesus. Don't take it up with me. It's in the Bible. <laughs> Jesus said the poor you will always have with you but don't miss this opportunity. Some things ain't never gonna change. Y'all hearing me? 
Let me help all of y'all. Everybody that's poor in the world ain't gonna suddenly be rich tomorrow. Some things are never gonna change. But that has nothing to do with you making the most of every opportunity to worship him. God's good. I keep thinking about quitting, and then I change my mind. <laughs> Worship does not need a perfect condition. It just needs an opportunity. She did not care what others thought. She refused to give others control of what she had. They said it should have been sold. She said, I'm going to worship him with it. Her worship permeated the atmosphere. Your worship has in it the power to affect everybody in the room. Her worship was performed to the extreme. It was proper, Butch, for her to go to his feet and anoint his feet. She didn't do that. She went to his head and anointed his head. She broke the custom. Some of y'all need to break your custom in how you worship God. You worship him the same way all the time. So I push on you and lean on you by getting a little more loud, a little more radical, a little more excessive, a little more extreme, and you go, oh, I don't know about that. Let me help you. There are some things you never go enjoy until you do some things you've never done. You say, Bishop, I don't believe in that. Then you read the Bible because some people don't get healed of leprosy until they go to a muddy river and dip down seven times. That don't make no kind of sense. And sometimes God tells us to do things with our worship that don't make no kind of sense. And until you do it, you're not gonna receive the blessing that God has ordained for you to enjoy. Finally, and I'll close. Finally, and I'll close. Her worship had a price to it. The worship that God requires will always cost something. You say, come on now, Pastor Rick, read Romans 12, 1 and 2. A living sacrifice is sacrificial living. It's costing you something. <laughs> Woo! Everyone say value. See, there's two kinds of value. There's monetary value and then there's relative value. Right? In other words, it's like this. If I'm selling my house and they come put an appraisal on it, that's what they say it's worth. But guess what? They don't own it. That's monetary value. But relative value is what I think it's worth. So if you want to buy it and we both need it, you have to ask yourself, who's it more valuable to? Because the person it's more valuable to will pay more to get it. Shoo, come on in the building. They said, it's waste. Sell it. Give the money to the poor. She said, it's all I got. My worship is the most valuable thing I have. Your worship is the most valuable thing you have. It puts you in the will of God. It brings you into intimate relationship with him. It creates communication lines. We can praise, pray, prophesy, do all we want to do. But until we enter into a devotion of worship, we will have a hard time seeing what is called the mysteries of God. He said she did it for my burial. Her worship opened up a future that nobody else even knew about. Good God, man. When you were worshiping today, y'all were worshiping, that thing hit me. And I'm telling you, I knew right now something just broke. Not for you, but for me. All of a sudden, see, Tony, all of a sudden got me an attitude that said, I don't care. 
I do not care what other people think. Watch. About how I serve God. You're not going to tell me how to preach. You're not going to tell me how to pray. You're not going to tell me how to worship. You're not going to tell me how to praise. That's mine. And if it's yours, don't fall into the trap of needing votes. There are people in this building today. Let's stand. That you're going through a broken season tonight in the night of worship. There's going to be a release of God's spirit in this place. You know what Jesus said in John chapter 4? The Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth is reality. That's what truth is. So when he says, I'm seeking those who will worship me in spirit and in truth, he said, I'm not looking for people that wear facades when they worship me. The truth is I'm hurting right now, but I'm going to worship him anyway. The truth is I'm going through a bad season, but I'm going to worship him anyway. And if you're in here today and you say, Pastor Rick, I needed this word. I needed this today. This meant something to me. Something you said hit me. Come down here right now. I want to pray for you. Just come on. This is your word. You say, Pastor, this is my word. Just come. Just come. Just come. Hallelujah. I've been going through brokenness. A season of desperation. Just come. Just come. When you get here, will you lift your hands, please, and just begin to worship him. Can I say this? I just felt this right here, Gino. Yeah, y'all keep playing, but I just felt this. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Worship can get ugly. <laughs> worship can get real ugly. What do you mean, Pastor Rick? Have you ever seen anybody going through a broken season they start worshiping God? All their makeup is running down their face. Have you ever been balled up in a fetal position in the corner of your bedroom holding both your sides and all you can do is worship God because you're losing everything you had and you don't know how to stop it? You're going through the worst time of your life and all you know to do is worship.